this particular day, I uh, had gotten in my Suburban, was leaving my home that morning, and the Spirit of God spoke to me to go back into my house to get a book of Scripture and that I had compiled, uh, you know, two years previous to that. I'd been adding to it, and it contained nothing but Scripture that I would confess and uh, with the intent of just letting that word live and abide in my heart. So I got that book, and I put it in my car, and along with about four evangelistic magazines and about ten evangelistic tapes that I had sitting in my car, and I was on my way to do a, some volunteer work, and I went to do that, and on the way home, I had to get a few more Christmas presents, and across the street was a Kmart, which I had only gone to twice in nine years. It was not a, a stopping off point for me, really. It isn't even on the way to my house. But I went into Kmart, was there about an hour, and came out to my car. As I was approaching the car, I felt a gun in my back. And I turned around, and this, this man looked at me, and he was shaking, crying. Uh, he looked like a rabid dog, really. I don't know how else to explain it, but he looked satanic. And... The first thing I thought was, you're going to die today. That was the first thought that went through me. But with my mouth, I said, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> and <laughs> he looked at me and he said, no, I don't. Get in this car. And <laughs> so I got in the car. He made me sit over in the passenger side of course, I did not realize this man, I hadn't been watching the news or read the newspapers, at this particular time they had helicopters circling the city of San Antonio looking for him. He had been on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, uh, as I understand, for the last 10 years, had been eluding the FBI, and uh, he had raped and brutally murdered women all over the country and was known for his intense hate for women. I knew none of this. And uh, in fact, some friends later told me that the police were going up and down the, some of the neighborhoods there telling women to get into their homes. And uh, here I was with this man. Well, as I said, I sat in the passenger side and he was in the driver's seat. He lo I have an electronic door lock, which he locked. And the next thing he began to tell me was, sit on your hands. I want you to sit on them because if you try to move, I will kill you. He had killed a girl in early morning at 2 a.m. and I was in the car with him 2 in the afternoon is when he abducted me. And um, she had tried to escape and he shot her, which I did not know anything about this either. As I was sitting on my hands, he began to tell me how he had escaped, the police had raided uh, an apartment where he had was keeping a girl tied up. She was kidnapped. And he, evidently, they raided the apartment and he escaped through the window. He said, I've been running all over town. I had a little bit of money and I've been taking buses all over the city. And uh, he said, a strange thing happened. I went into a church this morning and I didn't know what to do. So I just walked out and I said, I've been sitting at this Kmart for hours. While he was telling me this, he was crying and shaking. But the Spirit of God was uh, mighty in me, and I said, what's your name? And he said, it's Stephen. And I said, I'm going to put my hands on you and pray for you right now. And he said, no, you're not. I don't want to be prayed for. And I said, be quiet and shut your mouth. And I just put my hands on him. <laughs> And, uh, of course, I can't remember everything I said, but uh, it was something to the effect of I take authority over every demonic force in this man. You know that I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and I declare right now, you have no dominion over this man. Sin shall not have dominion over him. He has dominion over you, and I have dominion over you, and he will be serving Jesus Christ before this day ends. And, of course, after this, he looked at me and he said... <laughs> I can't believe this. I'm in the car with a religious freak. <laughs> he said, 
I don't want to steal anything from you. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to do anything that would hurt you. I just want to talk to you. I need help. <laughs> and so, you know, I put my hands back under me. Just, I was going to sit on him. He said, don't do that. He said, I just want to talk to you. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I said, you know something? You think that you abducted me today, but God put me in this car with you. And I said, you've been telling me that you want to kill yourself and end your life. And I said, I want to tell you something. If you kill yourself today, you've led a life the tail on this earth. And I said, if you kill yourself today, you're going to the, to the real hell, Stephen. And it's thousands of times worse than any hell you've ever encountered in this earth. And I said, Jesus Christ put me in this car with you to tell you, your time is short. If you don't accept him, you will go to the real hell. And I said, you deserve to go there. But Jesus Christ paid the penalty. He went to hell for you in your behalf so that you would not have to go there and I said there is not one person that deserves it but we serve a God of love he said listen he said you know you have this calmness about you I had a, a calmness come over me a very strong calmness and he said why aren't you trying to escape out of this car you don't seem like you're afraid and I said I'm not I said you know something Stephen there's no fear in love perfect love casts out fear and uh, this, we were still in the parking lot of Kmart talking. And he said, you know, I think I want to get a Coke. And so we drove over to, uh, you know, a Whataburger and got a Coke. And he, uh, <clears throat> you know, the fear started to come upon him again. And he said, I know I'm going to kill myself today. I know there's going to be a road blockade out for me. And uh, I, I said, let me tell you something. I said, there's a scripture in the word of God that says, if God be for you, who can be against you? And I said, Stephen, if you've got God Almighty on your side and the whole world is against you, who do you think is going to win? And he said, the one that has God. And I said, all right, I've got God on my side and no weapon formed against this car or me or you is going to prosper in the name of Jesus. And uh, he calmed down considerably. And he said, I want you to lead me to a secluded spot where we can just talk. I just want to talk to you. And, um, of course, he assured me not to try anything funny. But I, I wasn't about to, you know. I didn't, it wasn't even in my heart to try anything like that. Because uh, I had the compassion of Jesus Christ just overwhelmed me. I had a, um, a lot of compassion for this man that goes... When you walk in the Spirit of God, it goes against your natural mind. Your natural mind is repulsed almost by this individual. But the love of God is a love that knows no barriers. It is beyond the sense realm, beyond the reason realm. It goes beyond that. It's the uh, capacity to love the unlovable and to go beyond feeling or reason. And anyway, I, I led him to a secluded place. But he... It was right by a 7-Eleven, and that's where he wanted to be because he said it would look strange uh, if we weren't in an area where people were walking around. So I, you know, I didn't care where we were as long as, uh, you know, I was sharing the Word of God with him. And I parked by the 7-Eleven, and <clears throat> he began to tell me, I will never go back to prison. I'll never go there again. And I said, you know something, you're in prison right now. You don't need to go be behind bars. You're in prison right now, Stephen. And he said, you know, you're right. I am. And uh, he said, you know, I feel more love from you than I have from anyone in my entire life. And I said, well, you know what it is, Stephen, is Jesus is not going to manifest himself to you in the flesh unless it's a phenomena. But he will appear to you through his people. And the love of God is, t is more powerful than your hate, Stephen. It's a more powerful force than your hate or resentment. And I said, you know, uh, Stephen, it says in the Word of God that God so loved the world. It doesn't say God so hated the world or so condemned the world. It says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And I said, actually, you have had a stronghold, a satanic stronghold around you for years. And he said, you know, this, this Satan thing you keep talking about, he said, I know that force. I've done many things that I haven't wanted to do. With my will, I have not wanted to do them, but I just give in to it. 
and do these things not knowing why I do them. And he said, you know, I've had this driving force of hate and resentment in me ever since I can remember. Uh, he had a just a horrible childhood. His mother did not like him, in fact hated him. Evidently she did not love his father and transferred that hate to him and, and he chose to harbor resentment against that. You know, we have the power of choice in this life to choose. Just like we have the power to choose Jesus Christ. And he chose to walk in that resentment. And uh, got into the drug world and that resentment built into hate and hatred for women and then rape and murder. And he said, you know, I can tell you've never had anything bad happen to you in your life. And, of course, any God's going to love you. You've never had anything happen to you. And you've always been a model person and all this. And, and But look at me. You know, you don't really know who I am because you won't let me tell you about everything I've done. And, and I said, I don't want to know what you've done. I really don't. I said, Jesus Christ knows what you've done in your life. He went to the cross in your behalf and went to hell in your behalf to battle Satan in your behalf and be raised from the dead in your behalf so you could live in this life as a new creature in Christ and as more than a conqueror in this life. And um, he just looked at me like, I cannot believe you, lady. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I want you to call your husband and tell him that you are all right. And by this time it was 6.30. He had abducted me at 2. It was 6.30. I called home and... Uh, my husband had been playing golf with the man that owned Maggie's where the girl had been murdered the night before and they were talking about this. You know, you, you never even consider in a million years that your wife was with someone like this. You know, it's always someone else. And anyway, he got home and I called him and I said, I'm out and I will be home later this evening. And he said, what's the matter with you? You sound different. When I heard his voice, fear started creeping in on me because my thought, the thought that came to me is, when are you going to see your family again? When are you, will you ever get home? See, Satan will plant these doubts and fears to try to get you off the Word of God. <laughs> my voice was shaky when I was talking to my husband, and he said, I've lived with you almost 10 years, and I can tell something's wrong with you. What's the matter with you? And I said, nothing. I'll be home later. Of course, then he said, well, don't forget, we're going out with so-and-so. <laughs> you know, he had no idea what was going on. So uh, I hung the phone up and uh, got into the car, and Stephen said, what's the matter with you? You're not as calm as you've been all day. He could sense that fear instantly. And I was, you know, the plan wasn't going like I thought it was going to go. So... This doubt and fear was creeping in, like I told you. But, you know, after, after him saying to me, you look a little shaky, then I said, look, Stephen, I said, right now, we're just going to pray. And I took authority over the spirit of fear, and I said, you know, God has a plan today, and I'm not going to try to play God. So let's just flow with his spirit, because he's going to lead and guide us and show us exactly what to do. And we both began, he got calm the minute I did, and we both got back in the car. And uh, he mentioned, why don't I go to, uh, to Austin? And then he said, you know, I think that, I bet you there'll be a road blockade. And he said, if there is, there'll be a shootout, and I'll probably kill myself. And I reassured him again that he would not kill himself, because my God was able to deliver us. <laughs> and he had delivered us from the power of darkness. So, right then, uh, all during this entire day, I was praying in the Spirit. Not uh, He could not hear me, but I was praying constantly while he was sitting there talking. He'd talk, and I'd pray in the Spirit. And then, uh, while he wasn't talking, I'd be teaching the Word if I wasn't uh, praying in the Spirit. I told him, I said, uh, Stephen, I feel the Lord is telling us not to go to Austin at all, that there really will be a road blockade. And... Uh, but I said, the Spirit of God keeps telling me to go to Kerrville for some reason. Well, by this time, he says, I'll do what you want to do. He said, are you an angel? <laughs>
I felt like saying, just ask my husband sometimes. <laughs> but I didn't say that. But <laughs> anyway, um, he decided Kerrville was a good idea. And I found out later there really were road blockades on every exit out of San Antonio. And I'm sure at one time there was one going up to Kerrville, but they never encountered us and we never encountered them. Uh, shortly after after we decided to, or the Spirit of God really decided that we were going to go to Kerrville and we were obedient to the Spirit of God, he wanted me to go into the 7-Eleven and get him a paper and some beer and cigarettes. And I said, well, I will do it on one condition, that you don't make me read what you've done, because I don't want to hear what you've done. I don't care about what you've done. There is nothing that is so bad that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse it and forgive it. There is not, nothing and no one that is that bad. And he was one of the worst. So he said, I won't make you read anything. So I went in and got him the paper. And, of course, he was headlined. And by this time it was dark. And we went and gassed up my Suburban. And right after that he said, I'll be needing some money once I get there. And so we drove through. My bank was right there. And we drove through. And I said, well, how much would you like, Stephen? And he said, whatever you find it in your heart to give me is all right with me. <laughs> so the Spirit of God put a sum of money on my heart, and I, I gave it to him, and he started crying. And he hugged me and said, you, you're just the most wonderful person I've ever met in my life. And he said, you know, he said, this love I feel is not sexual. It's nothing like that. It's, a, it's something I have never experienced before. I've never felt this, ever. And, uh, well, from that point, we proceeded up the road to Kerrville, and, like I said, it was dark. Um, <clears throat> as we were going up the highway, I had a tape, and I said, would you like to listen to this? And he said, yes, I would like to hear it. So we put the tape in, and he was uh, really listening to it, really listening to the words, and... I guess he listened for about 10 minutes, and he turned it off, and he said, I want to tell you something. I have this son that I haven't told you about, and I never want him to have to go through what I've gone through. And I said, well, you tell me something, Stephen. If this son of yours had committed the crimes that you've committed, do you think you would still love him? Do you think you could forgive him if he had done the things that you've done? And he said, you know, I would die for my son. And I said, well, I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ died for you. That's what he did for you. And I said, he loves you thousands of times more than you could possibly love that little son. And he paid the penalty. You're willing to pay that penalty for your son. And Jesus paid it for you. As sinner's death, Stephen, is to go to hell for eternity. He went to hell for you, so you don't have to go to hell. I said, he was raised incorruptible and when the incorruptible word of God gets in you and you believe it you've got eternal life Stephen well he said you know something you've been preaching to me all day and I finally understand what you're talking about and he pulled the car over to the side of the freeway and to me this next incident was just nothing short of it was just the power of God in manifestation he pulled over and his hands went straight up in the air. And <laughs> while his hands were raised up, he said, Jesus, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. Please forgive me. I want to go to heaven. Um, I just was could not believe my eyes. <laughs> it wasn't as if I was laying my hands and saying, please repeat after me these words. You know, I wasn't doing a thing. All I had done was... Uh, to the best of my ability, been obedient to the Spirit of God, and he took over in Stephen's heart. Well, shortly after that, he looked at me. He was still sitting there. We, we sat there for about 15 minutes, because after he did that, he began to cry, and he said, I want to tell you something. It's gone. And I said, what is, what's gone? And he said, that hate I've been telling you about all day, it's gone. And that resentment is gone. <laughs> If someone like this, who has lived on the con for 30 years, 
and been eluding the FBI for 10 years is not going to say they feel it if they don't feel it. Believe me, he's not about to say something if it's not a reality to him. And he said, something just happened to me. I am not the same. I don't feel the same. It's like this cleanse. It's, I can't explain it. And I said, you've been born again, Stephen. That's what happened to you. You were born again. And I said, I'm going to explain to you what born again means. And uh, I said, the first time when you were born of your earthly father, you had his seed in you. And that seed in the word of God is called corruptible seed, which means it's going to die. Your flesh is going to die. But when you receive Jesus as your Lord, all of a sudden God plants his seed in you. And that seed is in the word of God called incorruptible seed, and which means that you will not die. You will not, your, your physical body will die, but your spirit will have eternal life. It's incorruptible. That's why it's called being born again. You were born once of, the, of your earthly father, now you're born again of your heavenly father. And uh, I said, you know, I feel like Ananias. I mean, <laughs> and he, I said, this reminds me of Paul. And he says, who's Paul? <laughs> he really didn't know anything. <laughs> Nothing did he know in the word of God. And he said, do you mind if I just hug you and cry on your shoulder? I just want to cry. Just, I just want to cry. And he did. He just sobbed. Well, he started the car up, and he was totally different after that. He really, he was... Smile. I had not seen him smile the entire day. His eyes were extremely peaceful, and he was not the same individual. He was a new creature in Christ, no doubt about it. And uh, he knew it, too. He said, I don't want to do this anymore. And, and then he stopped the car again, and he held his gun up in the air, and he said, I want you to uh, open your purse up. And he unloaded all the bullets into my purse. And he said, I don't ever want to do this again, ever. I'm through with this. He said, I want to tell people about Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, and he really, all the way up there, he was, yeah, I mean, he was just praising Jesus on the road up to Kerrville. And when we approached Kerrville, of course, he said, you know, if there's not a bus here, that can take me to Fort Worth, you're going to come with me. I said, there will be a bus, Stephen. I'm sure God has prepared a bus for you to get on to go. So I went into the bus station, and I said, do you have any buses that are going to Fort Worth anytime soon? And he said, well, of course we do. The next bus coming in is going to Austin, connecting to Fort Worth. <laughs> And, you know, it could have been going back to San Antonio, El Paso. It couldn't be gone anywhere, but it was going exactly where it was supposed to be going. Well, we had about uh, 45 minutes before it left, and we went and got a hamburger, McDonald's. By this time, we were friends, and we sat in that parking lot eating our hamburgers, and I told him that, I said, Stephen, you cannot use these weapons anymore. You can't use your guns or knives anymore because... You have been fighting a spiritual demonic force, and these little puny earthly weapons aren't going to cut the mustard in the realm of the spirit. I said, how do you think I'm sitting here with you today, and we're laughing and we're friends? And I said, the scripture declares that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, we they're not man-made weapons. They're not carnal. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I said, I'm going to teach you how to become proficient in operating the weapons in the spirit realm. And I gave this book to him and I said, I want you to take this. And when you get on that bus, I said, I want you to say the scripture out of your mouth, not to yourself. You said, out of your mouth so Satan can hear you. Because he will come and tell you that nothing happened to you. And I want you to assure him that you are a new creature in Christ. Because he will not obey anything unless it's the Spirit of God. He won't obey your little puny word. But he will obey the authority of the word of God in the name of Jesus. He knows he was defeated. But he wants to see if you know it. <laughs> so he, he didn't want to leave. He, was, he said, I don't want to leave. I've never met anyone like you in my life. And I know that, that God did put us together. And... Um, I said to him, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get home, but I can tell you I cannot lie for you. 
And from what I understand, he has never let any girl go. Um, but he said, I could never, you know, I'm just a different person now. And he got in the bus waving to me, smiling. <laughs> and, uh, of course, people asked me, why didn't you call the police right then? But, you know, I could have called the police at any time that whole day. And there were many chances and opportunities I had to tip people off or make a phone call to the police. But when you're walking with the Spirit of God, you obey Him. Because if you don't, you might end up dead. I could have ended up dead trying anything. Because my your reason will say, we'll call the police. But the Lord can see the end before the beginning. And He knows exactly. He will order your steps. He says He will make the crooked places straight and go before you and fight for you. So... Uh, I just put my hand in his hand and trusted him totally. I drove off before the bus, and, of course, as I told you, I didn't know that he was a big celebrity in the criminal world at all. I thought I was going to get home and say to my husband, you're not going to believe what happened to me today. <laughs> well, he had seen the 10 o'clock news, and, of course, Stephen Moran was the first story on, and they said, we believe that he has remained true to his pattern. He's probably picked up a woman on the north side. And, well, my husband started to panic. And uh, our next-door neighbor is his partner. So he went over there and said, do you think I'm just crazy to believe my wife, Marty, could be with this guy? And uh, they said, no, we don't. You better call the police. The partner's wife said, wait a minute. She was going to buy you this hunting rifle in Austin. Maybe she went up there, you know, as a Christmas present. Maybe she went up there to get it and had a flat tire on the way home. And his partner said, well, I hate to tell you this, but she's already gotten it. Well, hell, you know, just think. <laughs> well, he called the police, and when I got home, my house was just surrounded by police. And, of course, he was standing out in the front of the house, and he was very fearful. But when he saw me drive up and I was smiling, his fear turned to mad. He was furious. He was furious. He said, look at her. There's nothing wrong with her. She hadn't been with that guy. She's just fine. He was just furious. <laughs> I waved to him when I drove. <laughs> he yanked that car door open. Where have you been? And I said, you see all these bullets? Do you see the headlines of this paper? I've been with this guy all day long. And he, he started, his knees buckled, and his partner picked him up. He said, I was in better shape than he was and all the police. <laughs> the police, really, they were just buzzing around my car, getting fingerprints, and they just couldn't believe it. And I kept saying, but you all don't understand, this man has given his life to Christ. And they said, get her a martini right now. She's all shaken up. <laughs> and Next thing I knew, I was down at the police headquarters telling the story to the sergeant there. And as I started to tell him the story, he said, now just wait a minute. And he went out to my husband and said, I'm a Christian, but is your wife prone to fabricate? I mean, does she make tales up? This is the wildest tale I have ever heard. <laughs> he said, I would believe it if I were you. Well... I told him the majority of the story, but I could not tell him the part about Stephen being in Austin. He was in Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. You know, I did not want to betray this person, and uh, I had, you know, a lot of things going on in, inside of me at the time. I thought, I just, I don't want this person, I don't want to destroy Christ for them. If they find out I've just knifed them in the back immediately... You know, is he going to still stand on the word of God? You know, the parable of the sower, where the sower sows the word, and it says Satan comes immediately to steal the word of God. And so I wanted to the best of my ability to be obedient to the Spirit and intercede for him so he would be strong and be able to stand against that attack. I went home, and when I got home, it was like a buzzer went off inside, and I said, I've got to tell you, I know where he is. I can tell you now where he is. He's in Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. He's been there three hours. And my husband, you know, why didn't you tell me this? What's the matter with you? <laughs> and I said, I just couldn't tell it. I could not tell it until now. And he went over to the phone, called the FBI, and 
said, my wife knows where he is. He's in the bus station in Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. And, of course, the FBI agent said, you know, she's crazy to believe that a man that's been eluding us for 10 years is going to be sitting in the Austin bus station for three hours reading her book of scripture. He said, there's just no way that man probably got off the bus in Kerrville and is long gone. He said, you know, people don't get on the 10 most wanted list by being stupid. And uh, he said, there's a very slim and none chance this guy's going to be sitting there doing what she thinks he's doing. And he said, well, you know, you just take or leave the information. Uh, about a half hour later, that same sergeant called back and he said, I just want to tell you what has happened. He said, I decided I ought to call the Austin police. And he said they surrounded the bus station there and they were expecting a shootout when they walked in and they... They saw him sitting there, and he was reading this little black book. <laughs> and uh, he, Stephen stood up, and he said, the sergeant said he gave us all of his weapons. He said he also had two knives in his boots, and he had another pocket full of bullets, which he could have reloaded his gun, and he did not. And he said he gave us all of his weapons and told us that, he said, if I had seen you police uh, sooner today, there would have been a shootout and I would have killed myself, but today I met this lady and she changed my life. The sergeant says on the phone, well, all I can tell you is, uh, well, God bless you. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it there have been so many things happening since then, it would take me, you know, another hour to tell you, but I'm not going to. But I am going to say, like I said before, you know, God has no hands but our hands in this earth. What um, touched my heart and hurt me was the fact that this man had been walking around for 31 years and never heard about Jesus Christ. You know, and there are thousands of people walking around just like him. He was married at one time, and his, I found this out later, that he, after he left his wife, she became a Christian. She went to a Billy Graham crusade, gave her life to Christ, and a few days before I met Stephen, she saw him on TV, saw something on the news about him, and she had a friend, and she said, we've got to pray that Stephen comes to the Lord Jesus. And they both prayed in her house. And that prayer really started the ball rolling. Because uh, that man had never been in Texas before, Stephen. And, of course, here he is in San Antonio. <laughs> I'm sitting in the car with him. But there is a scripture that says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong in behalf of those people whose hearts are perfect toward him. And... He wants a vessel that wants to be used. Many people are walking around that have the knowledge of the word, but they don't. Jesus is not Lord over their life. You know, he wants, he wants to be Lord of every aspect of your life. Otherwise, he's, your will to make him Lord is what opens up the door for him to come in and use you. He wants a person that's willing to be obedient. Secondly, the power of love is what won that man. Not criticism, not telling them they're doing the wrong thing. They already know that. You know, an alcoholic knows that. But it's the love of God that cuts through those barriers and wins people to the Lord. God bless you all. I got a phone call from this person that said, Hello, I'm your sister in Christ. And she said that she had had a prison ministry and she'd been spending a lot of time with Stephen and asked me if I would please come in and see him. And I said, I just can't unless God really does something drastic and tells me to do something. So I began to communicate with her, and she was communicating to him. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I felt like God was telling me to go into the prison. And uh, I knew it was the Lord, but I didn't want to do it. I'd never been to a prison, and it had been you know, weeks since I'd gone through this. And uh, I was going to meet this woman who I'd never met. And I met her down there, and she said, listen, nobody can get in to see him. 
course, I, having never been in a prison, I didn't know you needed uh, lawyers' letters and things like that to get back to see somebody like that. And uh, they brought him out in shackles. I mean, his feet were bound and his hands were bound. He was behind the glass, and this policeman told me to go back there. And I said, me? And he said, yes. I said, well, I, you know, I can't. And he said, yes, you can. Go on. So he, he uh, allowed me to go back there, and when I did, Stephen started crying, and I said, why are you crying? He said, last night, I told God, tomorrow is my birthday, and the only thing I want for my birthday is to see that lady and to know that this is something true. That, I mean, you know, it's not something I made up. And he said, and here you are. I started crying. I thought, this really was God. You know, he, of course, he said, don't feel bad about turning me in. He said, I, I'm not mad at all. I have a lot of peace, and... We had a, a long talk, and um, I saw him the day before he was executed, and before he died, the warden came up to me, and he said, Stephen brought me to Christ. He said, I realize now that I didn't even know the real Jesus Christ, and I'm really sorry that he's going to die because he's helped a lot of us back here, and the warden started crying. and but He said, this man really has helped a lot of us, and he goes into the chapel and prays a lot. But the day I saw Stephen before he died, he said, I'm going to tell you something that I never told you that happened that day. And he said, remember when I pulled the car over and, you know, I put my hands up in the air and I said, yes. You know what happened? And I said, what? He said, I heard an audible voice. And the voice said to me, this is the last time I'm going to call you. When I heard that voice, I knew that everything you'd said all day was true. I knew there was a Jesus, and it scared me so much that I stopped the car and put my hands up in the air. He said, I never told that to anybody because they thought I was so crazy anyway. I heard a voice, Margie, and it was a powerful voice. And uh, the other interesting thing to me was that my physical looks looked like the girls he murdered. You know, I've thought about that so many times, how you would never send a girl in to minister to a rapist especially when it looked like the people he had raped and murdered. I thought, you know, God, I was a piece of bait. But um, God's ways really are not our ways at all. He knows what he wants to do, and, and he's got his ways of doing it. I know God had been preparing me for a long time. Sometimes I just sit in my car while my kids are at school, and I just memorize the book of Ephesians or memorize um, Psalm 91. Whereas, you know, most people think like a normal human being and would have been terrified. I, he had programmed me so much to think the thoughts of the Word of God. I think that day, that's what surprised me so much about myself, and it was how much love I, and compassion I felt for him. I just, I would never have believed that I could have felt that. I, I mean, I couldn't have without God in me. I got a glimpse that day of of how God loves humanity, and it's just such a depth that we just can't even fathom it. It's so great. You know, it's changed me forever. That's for sure.